listen now to scripture as I read it to you from Genesis. This is from chapter 28. We continue the adventures of Jacob. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. The Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. You know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar, poured oil upon it, and he called the place Bethel. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the challenges of preaching a sermon series that builds on the previous sermon is that the preacher can never be sure if the congregation was present for the previous sermon. You know, television has a very clever way of dealing with this when they show a serial. They take the first 30 seconds or a minute or so to give an, in, uh, an overview of the previous show. And so today I thought that the best thing I could do is to give you a quick overview of last Sunday's message. 30 to 60 seconds. Are you ready? One, Jacob was sneaky. Two, he was a narcissist. He was lazy. He was selfish. He came from a dysfunctional family. He cheated his brother. He was smart and he was clever, but he used his intelligence for his own gain. You recall his brother Esau was working hard in the field and was hungry. And Jacob took advantage of this and traded him a bowl of stew for his birthright. Later, he completed his hat trick by deceiving his father into thinking that he was Esau in order to steal the blessing that was reserved for his older brother. Esau got mad, really mad, and threatened to kill Jacob. This would not be the first time in the Bible that a brother threatened to kill a brother. You remember Cain and Abel. So Jacob ran away, and he fled from his brother Esau. That's 67 seconds. This is the second sermon in a series on the life of Jacob. So far, one may wonder why Jacob is so important. Well, we've discovered in that first sermon, that God uses scoundrels. But the question still remains, how? How does God change a lazy, near-to-well con artist like Jacob into the father of a people, the patriarch of a nation? How? And so today, we're going to look at one of the better-known stories of the Old Testament. You remember when I was a child learning in vacation Bible school, the song, maybe you did too, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. Remember that one? Soldiers of the Cross. Children of the Cross. First, I want to look at that story, that beautiful story. 
Second, I'm going to show how Jacob's dream is the first step in his spiritual development. And finally, I want to look at the very nature of spiritual growth. What does it mean to grow and mature spiritually? Because I think that's all that's a challenge for each and every one of us, no matter where we are in life. Well, let's look at the story itself. It begins with Jacob on the run. You know, he was a fugitive from justice. You know, he was running from his brother whom he had cheated and even humiliated. But should we be surprised? You know, Jacob was a coward, and cowards run away. But he was not merely running away from Esau, his brother, no. He was running away from his own true self. He was running away from a confrontation with the reality of who he was and what he did. So he was a moral and psychological coward also. He was trying to flee the reality of who he was. He was not going to take responsibility for his actions. No. He ran away. You know, there's an expression, you can run, but you cannot hide. Jacob didn't know that expression. He thought you could run and hide. He believed that the tr truth would never come to light. But it would indeed that night. That night when he lay down to sleep. You see, when we lay down to sleep, our defenses begin to rest. And that's when even the most selfish person is vulnerable to the power of conscience. Remember, as a child waking up, because I could not sleep one night, I went downstairs where my mother was reading, and I told her, Mom, I can't sleep. I'm having trouble sleeping. And she looked up at me, and then she asked the question. She said, Brent, what did you do wrong? I wondered how she knew. It was then that she taught me the word conscience. And I learned about the human conscience and how if you don't take care of things, it will get back at you. I can't remember what I did. But I remember losing sleep. And I remembered learning about the power of conscience that evening and the importance that it plays in our moral development. You know, many years later, when I was a student at seminary, I would learn it was a Presbyterian principle. God is Lord of the conscience, that God speaks to us through our conscience. When our conscience is bothering us, we could be on the verge of an encounter with the divine. The conscience, it causes us to struggle Mentally, psychologically, and spiritually. These struggles of the soul often have a way of mugging us at nighttime when we are asleep. They wake us at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and we just lay there wondering. We wake up horrified, frightened, bothered, worried, our mind going 100 miles an hour, and we can't get back to sleep. St. John of the Cross spoke of the dark night of the soul. And indeed, I suspect that interrupted sleep and disturbing dreams are part of the struggles of the human spirit. And so we read that Jacob laid his head down and slept. And then he had a dream, the dream that we sing about. The dream was of a staircase, a ramp, a ladder, if you will. And it led from the very spot he was sleeping into the heavens. Angels, messengers from God, were ascending and descending the stairs. That's the account that we have of that dream. Not a complicated story. Not a difficult dream to remember. But it was profound. It was a vision that heaven and earth were literally joined by a staircase, by a ladder. 
The staircase between earth and heaven. What could it possibly mean? Does it not illustrate that heaven, the home of God, is not completely separated from the earth? That the angels, the messengers of God, the instruments of God's word to us, move up and down the staircase, indicating that God has chosen to involve himself in human history and in human affairs. The realm of God is not separated from us. God has joined our realm. It's an, it's an ancient vision. Earlier in the book of Genesis, you recall that the people of a town called Babel attempted to build a structure so that they could get to heaven. All they needed to do was sleep and have that vision. And they would see that that structure was created. Created by God, reaching from the heavens to the earth. It already existed. That's the direction of biblical encounters with the divine reaches from the heavens to the earth below, begins with God and moves toward humanity. And so that staircase of which Jacob dreamed was the prelude to an encounter. The prelude to an encounter with the divine. You see, Jacob was about to confront God. You see, it's at this moment, and here's what's interesting. You go back and look at those stories in, in Genesis. God wasn't a part of the story, not a part of Jacob's life. You know, I went back, I read them, and you know, I noticed this, that there is no mention of God in all those early stories of Jacob's life. The only place that God existed in all of those accounts was in the content of the blessing. Now, in this dream, God was powerfully present. You know, suddenly the story takes on a new dimension. And we're not only witnessing the accounts of things here on earth, but we're also having you know, an insight into what is happening in the heavens themselves. God revealed himself to Jacob. I'm the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. In that one statement, once again, we have the connection of all the generations. You know, it's no longer just Jacob. Jacob is seen as part of an extended family, part of a history of generations, part of a promise going back to his grandfather, Abraham. The God who revealed himself to Jacob on that evening was not a concept, not an idea, not some philosophical proposition, no. The Lord was and is a God who was in relationship with his people. And in that moment, the muddy mystery of history began to clear. Jacob was no longer a scoundrel on the run. He was the heir to a promise. A promise that was offered to his grandfather, Abraham. Jacob, a scoundrel, a cheat, a liar, and a con artist was claimed by God to become a child of promise. Jacob was awed by that dream. And when he woke, he said, truly this place is where God dwells. And so he renamed the town Bethel, which means home or house of God. This is the beginning of a change in Jacob. The psychologist John Sanford wrote that there are three ways that a human being grows spiritually. The first way is through suffering. Not merely physical suffering, but the suffering of the spirit, those struggles of the soul that takes place within us. Those struggles that waken us at night. The second is through a recognition of a power that is greater than oneself. A power that is at work in our lives is greater than we are. And the third is by coming to care for someone. It's interesting, the third one is going to be our focus for next Sunday's sermon. So you're going to have to come back to hear number three. Or you can watch it on video, I guess. We'll see how these three transforming powers are present in Jacob's life. Well, let's look at the first one. He struggled. 
he suffered. Jacob, you recall, was one who preferred the tents. He was a domestic. He was a child of comfort and luxury. He was a mama's boy, and mama took good care of him. Now he was in a desperate situation. He was on the run. He had to make do for himself. He had to scavenge food. He never had to do that before. And his brother out there made him bring him in. He had to do without all the comforts of life. What did he lay his head down? It was on a rock. He had to exist for himself in the wilderness. And here's the irony of it. His brother Esau probably could do that quite well. For Jacob, this was a struggle for life itself. And he was frightened. His struggles in the wilderness were an outward manifestation of what was occurring, though, deep in his soul. He was struggling with his identity. He was struggling with who he was. He was confronting the reality of his own shortcomings. You see, human struggles are not an antidote to egocentric selfishness. But they do have a way of opening up our souls to the presence of God and to the presence of others. Then he had the dream. Here God encountered Jacob. The narrative's language changes. We read that Jacob was afraid and in awe. Why fear and awe? Because he realized that he was in the presence of a power much greater than himself. He realized that his cunning and deceit would be of no avail. He was forced to acknowledge that there was a power that had control on his life, a power that was greater than he was. The significance of this? Jacob, like most egocentric individuals, was a control freak. He had to be in charge. He controlled events. He manipulated people, his brother, his father, and others. Now he was no longer in control, and there was a power he had to recognize that it was greater than he was. What was the effect of this? It was the break, it was beginning to break down his selfishness. He would soon begin to acknowledge that there were other people and other powers in the world beside himself. It wasn't all about Jacob, in other words. His egocentric attitude was bruised. And now there was room in his life for God and for others. The last question is, so what? So what? I think this is an awesome story about a spiritual journey and the growth and the development of the human soul. It's an account of an encounter with God, and it gives us five insights into the divine encounters and their spiritual growth. First, we learn an important lesson about human development and spiritual maturation. Well, there's a t-shirt that says, or a bumper sticker too, that says, you know, God isn't done with me yet. Maybe you've seen that. Well, in this story, we realize that God hadn't even started with Jacob until that night at Bethel. Human beings, no matter what their history, are never beyond the reach of God. Jacob's ladder reaches into our lives also. God initiates an encounter with us also. Human beings, egocentric, manipulating, and immature ones like Jacob can grow and can indeed mature. As I mentioned last week, this is a message of hope, but it's also a warning to us about our own judgments. We should write off people so quickly. We should not write them off so quickly. Second, we learned that often the spiritual journey takes us beyond our comfort zones. Jacob, we read, fled into the wilderness. There he was without bed, without food, without all the other amenities that he enjoyed of life. And when he was there in the wilderness, the divine encounter began. It's archetypal. Think about wilderness. Jesus, who we call, sought the wilderness before he began his ministry, because there he wrestled with who he was and his temptations with the devil. Some of the ancient religious communities would journey out into the desert, would even live there and exist there because they believed in the wilderness 
God would appear. There in the wilderness, they would be closer to God. Today, we associate wilderness with personal growth. Be it scouts out on a camping trip and practicing survival skills to the outward bound experience. And then Christian educators tell us that retreats, Christian camping, are important because so much more can be accomplished when participants are out of their zones of comfort and familiarity. You know, and I think for our generation today, that means no cell phones. Our comfort may be the very thing that insulates us and protects us from genuine spiritual growth. The third lesson we learn is one we long thought true, and that is the struggles of the soul are redemptive. That dark night of the soul can be a teacher that prepares the soul for transcendence and opens it to the future. Fourth, we learn that maturity and growth involves the recognition of a higher power. The recognition often takes place within a difficult and powerful encounter. And it can be both frightening and it can be awesome. Our spiritual struggles, our quest for identity, and our encounter with God have a way of breaking down our selfishness, our egotism, and our narcissism. All these things that govern our lives and enable us to acknowledge not only the existence of others, but the needs of others and our need to relate to them. And most of all, to acknowledge the existence of God. Last, we discover the importance all. The Jewish mystic Abraham Heschel wrote, there's only one way to wisdom, awe. Forget your sense of awe and let your conceit diminish your ability to revere and the universe becomes merely a marketplace for you. The greatest insights happen to us in moments of awesome wonder. Awe is what precedes faith and it is indeed at the root of faith. So we sing, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. It's a ladder that's not planted on earth, but rather it is anchored in the heavens with the divine. And we climb it fearfully. Each step involves struggle and loss, even pain. Each step requires us to let go of our self-centeredness and our narcissism. Each step, higher and higher, brings us closer to the divine. And when we gaze from that ladder, when we dare to look from it, we look upon God's creation. We look upon the universe that God has made, and we experience that genuine awe that at once recognizes how small we are, and yet how important we are to the one who calls us. In that moment, when our vision is filled with awe and wonder, we realize that we too are indeed children of promise. And this is good news. Amen.